uh, which which it is dominated in the rest of the world. The the rest, as you say it, and, and largely when you're talking about the rest, you're also focusing on Asia and China, right? In particular, but not just not just Asia and China. I mean, South America right. is. You know, essentially subordinate. Right. Africa's colonized. Right. I mean, if you just look at the world 100 years ago, you know, 1911, something like 80% of global GDP goes to about 11 empires. Mm -hmm. And those empires are Western-run empires. Right. And most of the spoils, most of the income, goes to the imperial metropole, not to the periphery, not to the colonial periphery. So the world of 100 years ago is incredibly unfair. It's amazingly skewed in favor of the West. So what's changed, and and does it mean the West decline, or and and the you know the East ascendancy, or does it mean that we just slow down, and the East is just growing faster? Well, we are living through extraordinary change after 500 years of pretty steady Western ascendancy, in the space of just three decades, in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. The gap has started to close and has closed very, very rapidly. In the late 1970s, as I think I said, the mm -hmm. average American is 30 times richer than the average Chinese. Today, it's more like a factor of five. So that's an amazing rapidly. compression. Right. And it's continuing because China's economy is growing at about 10% per annum. And it has been do doing so since the late 70s when Deng Xiaoping's reforms began. And the West has slowed down. And the financial crisis has really accelerated this process by, I think, fundamentally shifting the growth path down uh, of the United States and indeed of Europe. Because much of the growth that we saw in the run up to 2007 was based on leverage. Uh, and that game is over, that the American household mm -hmm. just cannot propel itself to the shopping mall with plastic and, and refinancing deals. So I think we are witnessing a profound change in the global balance of power. If you add up the GDP of the People's Republic of China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, so let's greater call it China, greater China, call it, right. which, by the way, the Chinese do already, mm -hmm. it's 90% of US GDP already. Already. China is very close to being the world's biggest manufacturer, probably will be in the next couple of years. China's gross domestic product will probably overtake that of the United States within the next decade. So this is an amazing transformation. The US has been the biggest economy in the world since 1872. At no point in the Cold War did the Soviet Union get even close to closing the gap. Mm -hmm. China's about to do it on our watch after 500 years when the West dominated the rest. And the reason is really simple. Those six killer applications that I described to you, well, they downloaded them. It was open access. Private uh, property? The private property is the exception to the rule in China. But if you look at the rest of the, the rest, if you look at India or Brazil, it's very straightforward. Mm -hmm. It's a story in which private property rights are getting more and more important. I recently asked a bunch of Indian CEOs, is the rule of law a reality in India? And if, you know, if we got into a legal dispute after I'd invested in your company and we went to law, would I have a reasonable chance of redress? And the answer was yes. So now that's China's the British rule of law, which was transferred to India, right? Yeah. I mean, one reason that India is in a different place from China is that it was directly ruled by the British for nearly two centuries. And that meant that many of the institutions of the West were imposed uh, on India. But in many ways, I'm more impressed by what's happened more recently since India embarked on economic reform in 1991, where essentially the killer apps, including the consumer society, including modern science and modern medicine, these things have been downloaded voluntarily because Asians realized that the only way that they could compete with the West was ultimately to adopt Western institutions. By the way, this process began a long time ago. Japan started mm -hmm. to do this in the Meiji era, in the late 19th century. But it's taken until our lifetimes for the really big Asian economies to get it and to download these killer apps. You mentioned the big exception, and that is that China clearly does not want killer app number three, right. private property the rights, rule of, rule of right. law, and ultimately representative government. Their view is it's an Asian fusion world mm -hmm. where you can order some things on the Western menu, but other things you want to have from the Asian menu. That, that is, I think, the Chinese model. And the big question for the next 10 or 20 years is, can they get away with it? Can they have a sustainable growth model in which they don't move in the direction of representative government and in which private property rights are not as secure as they are uh, in the Western world. And your answer to that well, question? My answer to the question is, is a twofold one. Number one, it could go wrong for China, depending on how big a role the state continues to play in economic life. If they carry on 
with the very aggressive privatization that we've seen, and I think they probably will, China is going to become economically a freer society. And I think ultimately that means it will become politically a freer society. I don't think the monopoly of power of the Communist Party is really compatible with a truly free market economy. I, I think ultimately that just won't be sustainable. But the second part of the answer is, what do we do? Do we remain true to the killer applications? Do we really believe in the achievements of Western civilization? Right, do we the West? Or do we cop out? Mm -hmm. And we the West, I think, have a dilemma here because many of the things that made the West great, we no longer really believe in them, or at least we don't take seriously those achievements of the past 500 years. Well, we don't them even for granted. Them. Yeah, of course, because it's all around as we grow used mm -hmm. to it. We take economic and political freedom completely for granted. Now, they take the work ethic. You see, one of the most interesting things that I try to show in the work that I've done that's going to be published as a book called Civilization later this year mm -hmm. is that we don't actually work as hard or as long as we used to. Well, actually, the numbers of hours worked in this country are, since, are, are down to 1995 levels. Right. That was one statistic I saw with a larger population. Right. So what does that tell you? And, and that is following a European path. In Europe, what you saw from really from the 1970s was that the rest of Europe converged on the Italian standard of really quite a short working year in terms of numbers of hours worked per year, whereas Asia is now significantly above. I mean, South Koreans work way more than people in the West. That's just part of it. Then you look at educational attainment. They work harder in school. I mean, they work way harder. You can see that in their attainment in mathematics at age 14. They're far ahead of in, most English-speaking countries. In math skills. I mean, Absolutely. It, it was, that was, I think, one of the most distressing statistics that we've all seen in a long time, is how far the U.S. has fallen in educational attainment. And that, to you, is, is alarming and, and also basically a very bad omen for the future, right? Well, if the scientific revolution is one of the killer apps, then how are we going to be the leading force in science if we consistently fail to educate people at high school to a level comparable with Japan, South Korea, and, uh, and parts of China? I mean, that's a simple no-brainer question. We have a problem. Now, it's easy at this point to be dismissive, say, of Chinese research and development or of all the patents that the Chinese apply for, many of which are granted. We call them patents. Patents. Yeah, right. I'm sorry, I'm speaking British <laughs> English. Correction uh, for viewers watching this in the United States, patents. Um, but the Chinese patents are increasing in quality. The research and development is getting better. Just look at the way in which Chinese scientific papers get referenced more and more than previously. They are premier players in the global science game. And the way that they're investing in scientific education means that that can only grow. They are going to overtake Germany in terms of patents granted really soon. Now, the Germans can't believe that when you tell them it, but it's true. So I think we're seeing a very, very fundamental shift, not just in terms of quantity, because, of course, with a huge population of more than a billion, yeah, China's a big economy just in mm -hmm. terms of raw numbers. But this is a quality story, the quality of education, the quality of science, and the quality, actually, of innovation. That's really going to be the key. And I think once you give those six killer applications, or in the case of China, five of them, to these huge Asian societies with their hunger, I mean, it's a real hunger to work, then it seems to me almost unstoppable that the world is going to tilt back to where it was 600 years ago when it was the East that really dominated the rest.